Welcome to New York City and Mission City Church. We're here to connect people with God and with each other. We hope you're encouraged by this week's message. Mark 4, verses 26 and 27. And he said, The kingdom of God is as if man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. Hey, everybody. Uh, great to see you or, or see you. Uh, I know you can see me, but I can't see you at this exact moment. But uh, we're going to get a chance to spend a few minutes together today. Uh, first things first, uh, this is not a, a normal format. This is very unusual, a first, uh, in fact, for us. But flexibility is at the heart of church planting. Um, so we are a, a, a new, I can't say brand new forever, but we're a newish church plant and uh, flexibility flexibility required. Uh, right. So, uh, but today I am, uh, in Lubbock, Texas, which is where my father now lives. And the reason I'm there is because he's had a health emergency. And after church last week, I immediately, uh, went to the airport. Um, but then the airlines airlined, which is one of my new favorite verbs, not cynical, but they airlined, which means I didn't get on a flight. Uh, and then after a day or two of trying to find a way here just to see him, um, I just gave up and got in my car and drove. So I've been on the road this week. Uh, and, uh, and just for a health update, I know many of you have known, maybe uh, many of you, uh, especially if it's your first time at church today, uh, definitely don't. But uh, for his health issue, he had a, he had a cancer resurgence and then uh, pneumonia in his lungs, as well as a stomach issue all at once. And uh, they're solving the problems one at a time. And, uh, you know, doctors around us have a lot of hope. Uh, so that's a good thing, right? When doctors are around you with hope, you feel hope. So we do have hope. He is in discomfort uh, and it, it's serious, um, but there there is an approach uh, that's been formed. Okay, so just want to let you know that's where we stand. Uh, and want to thank you for your flexibility. Now, um, so I'm coming to you from from uh, from Lubbock, Texas today, where he resides, and um, and just spending a few minutes with my heart and mind focused on you. If some of you are wondering, did you feel like you had to do this? Um, no, I definitely wanted to. Today's the end of our Share Love series. We've been in the last few weeks of this uh, message series called Share Love, uh, and uh, a missiology for the modern world. Missiology, of course, means if you break it into two parts, missio means missionology, means study of. So study of our mission. So our church has a mission, right? It's critical. Uh, it's what drives us. So this is our final week of it. Uh, and finally, after crafting a lot of approach uh, to, to and a lot of posture, et cetera, in terms of delivery, in terms of rest and action, in terms of tying our humanitarian work to God and um, his existence, and it's hard for people and so on, we come now to what I think may be the very heart of the heart of our mission, which is to actually transmit the faith, faith transmission, to actually bring the faith um, to other people. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, I want to I want to start by praying, if we could. Uh, I know it's just an unusual format for us, but uh, before we go into the topic of faith transmission, let's let's pray to em- embrace God in the moment um, together. Uh, we've acknowledged the format. Now let's forget the format and uh, and let's let the words of Scripture. I'm, I'm got my scriptures in front of me here, and uh, let's just let them shape us for the next ten or fifteen minutes. And uh, and then some friends are going to to hop up on stage and uh, and share a few thoughts about how they're actually experiencing this. Uh, and you'll know more what I mean in just a moment. But let's just pray together if we could, church. If we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And we thank you that that's true in an experiential sense, that when we ready our hearts to come to you, um, your heart embraces us all the more. And we also thank you, God, that at the cross of Jesus Christ and in the life and the, the, the birth and life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ all throughout his life, um, you showed yourself to be drawing near to us even when we were going away from you. Lord, uh, let us experience just a little piece of your presence in these moments, um, capture our, our, our hearts and minds, and guide us forward on this important part of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, we're talking about faith transmission. Um, now, I want to say, I am aware that transmitting your faith from one per like like you have it, somebody else doesn't have it, and you're going to try to through appropriate means of well, this should be assumed. It's not always assumed, but to be clear, through appropriate means of permission, persuasion, conversation, not through force, not through guilt, not through anything of this nature. This should be that should be assumed by now. It's not always, uh, but just to be clear, if you haven't caught the rest of the share love series, we're not uh, we're certainly not uh, guilting or roping people into this. Uh, 
but through appropriate means, even, but, but here's the thing, even through appropriate means, right? Even through appropriate means of persuasion, even through, even, even with permission, the very idea that we would desire to share our faith, um, seems to be just a little bit, um, to your average, say modern secular New Yorker who just may not claim any, uh, faith group. And by the way, that may be you today if you're visiting, but it, I would just say, I am aware that to most, the fact that we would even want to transmit our faith is alarming, could be bothersome, could lead to a bunch of like cultural clumsiness and blundering around and kind of forcefulness, et cetera. And just the whole idea of trying to expand the space that the Christian faith is taking up on this planet, even through legitimate or slow moving means, sounds like just a little medieval, you know, to people. And I want to I want to challenge that before we uh, I want to address that and challenge it to some degree by res- by a response before we move on because if we move on to talk about transmitting our faith and that hesitation is kind of in your heart and mind which I do believe it seeps into the church as well we experience this hesitation it's not just those outside but uh, I want to just address that because I'm aware if we go on to talk about faith if we want to talk about you know transmitting our faith etc through any means um, even perfectly legitimate ones. If you're kind of hung up there, it's going to be a hard, you know, thing for us to move into. And um, to address that, I would just say everyone on the planet seems to have something to share. Now, that may be a little overstated. Everyone, you know, most people and most efforts, most organizations, governments, political causes, social groups, everything seems to have some fuel in it that I should share this, you know. We're a, one missiologist has called humanity a species of sharers. So we are built to share. And it's like whether it is the Christian faith or any other infinite things that are out there, it seems like human beings can't stop doing these steps. We can't stop discovering something. And then when we discover something good, it instantly seems to turn into responsibility. Because if we really loved people, we would share the good thing that we've found And in fact, to moralize it further, the world would be a better place if everyone would come to this experience or understanding or approach. That is behind a, that simple like skeleton of human, uh, that, uh, of human actions is below the surface of many movements that even disagree with each other. And even if they radically disagree with each other, they may have at their heart this sense of, I, this energy, you know, this energy behind so many of our contemporary movements in the world, this energy that I found a way to think, and it's a good way, and it should be everywhere, because if it was everywhere, it would be good for everybody. So I'm going to convince everyone, right? So we're actually a species of sharers. We can't stop doing it. So I'm convinced that if we were to say, look, because of, say, the church's past clumsiness regarding um, its own faith expansion, which uh, of which failures have been many and varied. I mentioned that last week, so I won't go again here. Uh, but if we were to say, you know what, the church has done it poorly in the past, maybe even you'd say to yourself, I've done it kind of poorly or overly done in the past, or I had an aunt or an uncle or a parent who was too forceful or something, and, or, or who knows what. You've just seen the church kind of flop when it comes to trying to share its own message and its own faith, or you just fear it. You know, We're just in a culture where we are not in a place where we're kind of you do you, which is ironically a way of thinking, which we try to convince others of ironically. And yet, if you if you are nervous about all of this, hopefully draw maybe just a touch of comfort that every behind every movement is a sense of mobilization. Hey, you found something. It's your responsibility to share. And I think that energizes a lot of what's around us. So to, to kind of put a sock in the church's mouth and, and say you can't talk is a, is a double standard. I read a missiologist, the same missiologist recently, and he said that that's the beginning of hypocrisy, is it not? Where we say the rest of the world can share what it wants to share, it feels passionate about. But as for us, we're the only group that loses its entire voice, right? So uh, as you can see, I'm definitely not going to err on the side of overly forceful, but I'm also not uh, aiming to allow our church or myself to go into some sort of, you know, silence is best and passivity is best. I disagree. The entire world is seems to be built on passionately sharing a message that it cares about. So um, and of course, we're, we're, we're out here saying that by grace, not because of anything that we uh, have deserved, but simply by the sheer grace of God, we have stumbled onto something that is unique and that in Christ are all the w- treasures of wisdom and knowledge and that in him is the salvation of the world and that in him, the arms of God are flung open wide to every culture and nation and tribe and tongue and ethnicity. And we're saying that in him is a unique treasure. So you bet we are signing up to attempt to transmit the faith.
So uh, I just wanted to address that. And of course, you can't have a non-sharing Christian faith. If you take the missional component out of a human being, I'd say you've robbed them of some of their humanity because we're a species of sharers. But certainly if you take the sharing component out of the Christian faith, you don't have the Christian faith anymore. You've got something else. So with these things in mind, I just want to share a, a, a scripture today, one scripture. This is Mark chapter four, uh, verses 26. And I'm just going to read through 27. There's a, a, a couple more verses to the parable, but I'm just going to read two because they draw so much encouragement uh, on how to go about this. Okay. Uh, I've been thinking about evangelism for a long time. I've been trying to get Christians to evangelize for a long time. Uh, and this verse has led to the most peace for me lately. Okay. So I'm talking about up to the moment current. This is the one thing I want to share um, before we have a couple of friends hop up and talk about how this is actually done and going. All right. So here it comes, Mark chapter four, verse 26. Jesus said, the kingdom of God. Now, the kingdom of God is not a, is not a state. It doesn't have uh, borders and, and it doesn't have a military or a police. It, it, it's, it's a, it is a spiritual thing. Kingdom of God is anywhere God is king. Anytime a human being says, God, you're my king. I, I, I receive you as my king. You're the rightful king of my life and heart. The kingdom of God just gained one. Okay, that's how the kingdom of God uh, expands. And that's what it is. Not a political entity. The kingdom of God, Jesus said, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now, some of you think you know this one because there's a very faint, a more famous parable where Jesus said, it's as if the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. And there's all all these different types of soil, metaphorical types of human beings, types of responses that respond to it. Um, This is not that one. So um, don't, don't think you got it. Here it comes. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. Now, of course, the seed is the gospel message. The seed of the gospel message is what I just hinted at, right? It's what I just said a couple of times. It's what I just included when I prayed. The, the, the gospel message is that God has loved us even when we did not love him and that we are on the visited planet where God has decided to walk among us for the purpose of bringing him back to himself. So... Uh, that's good news, okay? And so that's the seed that we're throwing out here, okay? And he says, it's as if a, a, a person should throw it out there. Now, what does that tell you already? There's imprecision. Um, you're just going for it. You don't know where it's gonna land or how it's gonna go. You're just kind of going. You're trying, right? It's as if a person should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps. So the person who throws it on the ground sleeps. It literally says, and Jesus said, the kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground, he sleeps and rises night and day. And the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. Those words are music to me because it releases the pressure of me or you knowing how to get the kingdom of God to advance. This is such a pressure reliever for me. Oh, like just to realize I am supposed to do something. So let's be clear on like my job versus God's job. That just, that would be so orienting and so pressure relieving for us. What's my job and what's God's job? Okay, so in transmitting the faith, clearly my job is to try to do it, okay? To open a door or or even knock at a door. You notice that it doesn't say the kingdom of God is as if a man should sit still and wish that, you know, it's not that he's actually throwing the seeds. Okay. So let's not say that our job is, is, pa- is total passivity here because it's definitely not. You got to do something. Okay. And some people are like, well, I don't want to, I don't want to like beat people's door down. Well, I totally agree. But it says, Jesus, it says in, in the scripture, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Right. Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. He didn't say, behold, I stand at the porch creepily and silently and hope someone will come open the door for me and say, will you come tell us? You know, so there's at least a simple initiation you know, there. And so similarly in this, in this parable, like we see, okay, there is, there is an action required to try to spread this message. Do we want to? Okay. So there is a participation, there's an action, but after the action of attempted initiation, there is a complete release of the process, uh, to whatever is going to drive it. And there is also this sense of mystery where I don't know how. It says he sleeps and rises night and day, the seed sprouts and grows, and he knows not how. You know, while you sleep, some, God might be doing something in someone around you that needs to be done, okay? While I sleep, God might be doing something in me that needs to be done. So while you sleep, you know, 
God might be doing something in you that needs to be done. And all the people around you may know that it needs to be done. And all the people around me may know that it needs to be done, but that doesn't mean they know how to achieve it. We know not how the kingdom of God advances. We know we have a role in it. Yes, we've got to throw seed out there somehow. But we don't know how to achieve the actual response. Let me give you an example. Uh, two, two radically different responses. Most people are kind of in the middle, you know, but uh, here's two radically different responses. I, I, I've shared the gospel and or, and, or um, just simply tried to mention church and God and invite people to church um, quite a bit. And, uh, you know, here's two, here's two very different responses. One time I was talking to a guy and uh, public, this is public. This is like, ice, you know, ice cold conversation. Something comes out of nothing and, you know, just you win some favor in the conversation and you just get a chance to start talking with people, hearing where they're from, what they're about, et cetera. And at some point, you know, you get a chance to say like, hey, I have no idea if this is your thing, but if you'd like to come, you know, we would love to have you, you know, and, and invite somebody to church. So I did that once and this guy go, he looks me in the eye <laughs> and he goes, I will come. And I said, it was almost too easy. And I said, really? Uh, great. And he, he, he leans forward farther and he goes, I will come. I will bring my family. It will be my church. <laughs> and so it was so, and you know how that happened? Me neither. I don't know. He knows not how. I threw the seed out there and this person had a favorable response and I know not how. Uh, now here's on the other hand. Um, I was just, this one was more recent, just a few weeks ago. Uh, I was driving to church. Well, this was before, this was before actually we, we had the car. I was Ubering to church, whole family in the Uber. And a uh, guy about my age driving. Um, and, and he was saying, I, I, just, I think we were early in the ride and I think I said something like, we're headed to church this morning. Thanks for giving us a ride. You know, why not? And just to get the conversation rolling, he was like, and he goes, man, that's crazy. I was just thinking about like my life and he, he and he like kind of delves into the spiritual life. You know, sometimes when you mention church, you think everybody's going to run and some people do. Some people are like, whoa, and they want out and you just have to let them get away because they don't want anything to do with it. But then other people, you just barely bring it up and they swerve in. Like, it's like they were waiting on you, you know? And so we talked the whole way. I shared some of my life story uh, before I became a, a follower of Jesus, got a, enough checkered history to identify with some of what the guy was going through from my own story years ago. And he just, the more I could share, the more he was willing to open up and we were just able to kind of connect on these things. And by the time we get to, the, we got to the church, I'm thinking, this is great. Like, I, I mean, I, we have, I have literally shared that Jesus going to the cross and grave and being resurrected has changed my life. And now, you know, we're part of this church and all this. I mean, I've told him my testimony. We've got Jesus in and out of the grave. I mean, we've covered the ground. We've been in a car for 45 minutes. We didn't have to force anything. It was natural. And I invited him to church. And he said like, yeah, man, maybe I'll do that sometime. And it was one of those, like, it was real clear. He wasn't coming and he did it. Why did that happen? I know not how, right? I don't know. I just know I'm called to scatter seed, right? And that is good enough for me. Jesus said the kingdom of God is if a man should scatter seed on the ground, he sleeps and rises night and day. The seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. We don't know how, church. And I'll tell you what else we don't know. We don't know God's dealings with the society around us on this, on, in this societal moment, et cetera. And it's not our job to know that either, you know. Uh, I, I, but I, I'll tell you this. Let us not be the ones who don't throw seed out there because we already assume people's disinterest because that is simply not an option. That is just, that's just nowhere in this text. That's nowhere at the heart of our faith. It's nowhere in the heart of our tradition. And uh, I can tell you, if we're, at, if we're at our worst, whenever the church is overly aggressively trying to, you know, I don't know, shame people into church or something. Yeah, that's one version of our worst. The other version is where we just live in such a way that we, we, confirm everyone around us in total comfort uh, in such a way that we are not willing to take the risk to even knock at the door and be told no. That's a denial of our identity. That is, it's us quenching the, the natural overflow of our worship. And uh, to, to, to get into this space where you're willing to scatter, scatter seed, knock on the door, you know, and just attempt to, you know, have a conversation. It never comes from shame. It doesn't say the kingdom of God is if a guilty man to kill his own guilt should scatter seed on the ground because his pastor told him to. It doesn't say that, right? It doesn't come, this, this, is, this is not a, a function of guilt, you know, or force, but it's simply when we embrace God and we, just like human beings are, the species of sharers, we just can't hold back when we've found something. And it is simply a joy. When you, you, you'll you know it when it's a joy, right? Now, it can be a discipline. I'm not anti-discipline on this. Like, it can be a discipline to share sometimes. Uh, and there's space for that. So don't, 
If you've been passive for a long time on this front, don't wait for a wind of inspiration to just, you know, some gust to just whoosh you to do it for you. This is the gust, okay? This is as good as it gets, all right? So this is the moment, this is the time. Uh, di- there's a role for discipline and that's okay. But we're at our best when it's just a function of worship. And I embrace my identity. Jesus said the way is narrow that leads to life. That means if you're a Christian, you're a called out minority. You are a called out, chosen. Hey, come with me. You know, Jesus walks by Matthew. Hey, come with me. And he's, and he does. That, and then Matthew became one of the few souls on the planet who believed that this man was the Messiah. Enough to get up out of his chair and follow him. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are a called out minority And um, you're not going to be cool in this world, you know, and depending on where you're, where you're from or what kind of surroundings, how how your surroundings have viewed church your whole life, that may be an adjustment for you or it may not. But I know this to be a Christian is to be a call, a chosen minority, a called out minority and to follow King Jesus. And when you embrace that status, um, you'll find that you don't have anything to lose because you already got rid of the need for approval anyway, because you realized you weren't going to get it. You already broke up with the approval of humans. So if you've already broken up with the approval of humans because you have the approval of God, this makes it a lot easier, right? So I'm sitting in my dad's house right now, and I just want to say he did a lot of he he has done a lot of great things for me in my life, and um, and he's done a lot of great things for a lot of people in his life, and uh, I'm so confident that these doctors are going to get him fixed up and moving so that he continue he can continue being the guy that he is. The best thing he ever did was transmit the faith, and uh, when I was nine years old, honestly, I prayed a prayer with him. Um, he scattered seed on the ground and I, I prayed a prayer with him and it didn't do much because I acted uh, not of God for about the next decade and why that happened. He didn't know and why I came back to God, you know, at 19, 20, 21 it's in that area um, and just progressively turned back to God. Um, my dad didn't know that either. He knew not how, but uh, that's just how it went. He, 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 he scattered seed on the ground. It's made a difference in my life because when I wanted to turn back to God, I knew exactly which God to turn back to, right? Because my dad sat scattered seed on the ground, all right? And I'm thinking about that being in his home. I love you, church. At this point, um, we're going to have a couple of people uh, come up. This is Preston and Ellie, um, who are part of our church, and uh, particularly drawn uh, to, you know, uh, evangelism, to, to, to trying to proclaim the name of Christ in this, in this city. And they have experiences I don't have. This is why I'm going to stop talking early today after about 20 minutes here. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, uh, don't work with a lot of non-believers. Okay. So that's a joke because I am the only employee at Mission City Church. Uh, and I am a believer. So (laughs) there is no such thing. I'm not in your workplaces, you see. So, uh, in fact, I'm surrounded by a lot of Christians, so I kind of have to work at this. Um, but the, but, uh, but Preston and Ellie, uh, are actually in the conversations. They felt, uh, some positive turns and some conversations. They felt the sting of some cold indifference at times, I'm sure too. And uh, they're just gonna have an honest conversation about how this is working in New York City in 2023. Um, and uh, and by the way, if as they do that, you uh, you find yourself kind of itching in your seat, wishing you had something to share, send me a text or an email so we can get you up there next time and have you share in your experience as well. But for now, um, Preston and Ellie, um, you guys come on up. I love you, church. Thank you for supporting us and allowing us to be out. There was a planned vacation for our family for a few weeks coming up, and then I left a week early to come come here. So I won't see you in person for a little while, but church, uh, we love you. You're in our hearts. You're on our minds, and we know that we're on yours. Um, and I'm going to go hang with my dad now. Love you all, church. Nice. What's going on, guys? Uh, my name is Preston Newsom. I'm a member here at Mission City. This is Ellie also a member here at Mission City. Just like Garrett said, we're just going to share a little bit as we wrap up this series called Share Love, just about our experience in sharing our faith, both here in New York, but then, you know, also outside of New York. So we're going to bounce back and forth just a little bit here. Uh, I'm going to start with an easy question, just a nice layup. Uh, Tell everyone, where are you from? And then because we're talking about sharing your faith, who first shared their faith with you? Well, hello. Um, I am Ellie. I grew up in the D.C. area, so I've been in New York for about a year now. Um, And who shared my faith with me? I, you know, I technically, I grew up in a Christian house, but I would say my awareness of God was the size it was when I met him. Like, there there was not much depth to my sin at seven years old. (laughs) So the gospel had to be, like, this big for me. But when I was older, um, like 18, I got invited to a conference, Passion Conference, and a man on a stage just told me something I hadn't heard before. I hadn't heard the extent of 
the lengths Jesus goes to redeem the grossness of Ellie. And I was like, whoa, like this isn't just a seven-year-old faith. This is like the gospel's massive for me. And so, yeah, my awareness just expanded. And that's kind of how. Same thing for me. I feel like when someone, I'll get into that in a second, but when someone first shared the gospel with me, it did not take at all the first time. Um, I'm from Kansas originally, the great Mecca of Kansas. It's a fantastic place. Uh, I did not grow up in a Christian home. And someone, the first person who shared the gospel with me was a good friend of mine uh, in school. Her name is Maddie Jones. And it was kind of awkward. Like, I still remember she did. If you guys are familiar with this model, if you grew up in church, I was not familiar with it at the time. But there's the bridge, like, model of sharing your faith. I think it's Romans 6.23. And on one side, it says, like, wages of sin is death. And it says gift eternal life. Yeah, you're familiar. Uh, and Jesus, the cross bridges the gap. Uh, he is the, the free gift of eternal life uh, is found in, in Jesus, right? So she laid that out for me, and I think I was probably just like, I, I, I didn't say anything. It just did not register. Um, luckily, similar to you, I think at that point, I was about a junior, senior in college, and there were some other people that were really influential. Actually, playing Cajon was very influential in my faith. A good friend of mine as well, who I was the best man in his wedding, he invited me to play Cajon at House of Worship. He thought I was a Christian. Turns out I was just a nice guy. It, there, you know, it, those can get confused sometimes. He invited me to play at this thing called House of Worship. I just love playing Cajon. So it like did not register with me that it was going to be like a Christian thing. So I was like, let's go, dude. I'm playing Cajon. I love it. And then I'm in a house with like 200 people who are like singing worship songs. Uh, that was wild. I was not expecting that. But anyways, that was really influential in, in um, my faith. I think as kind of getting into the second question here, I think what stood out to me the most about that time that, that Maddie shared her faith with me and other people shared their faith with me was simply their desire to, like it was less about the exact words they use or the techniques, like the bridge model. That mattered less to me. What stood out to me more was that she clearly, kind of like Garrett was talking about, like she had something that she really felt was important enough that she wanted me to hear. And it was coming from someone who cared a lot about me. And that really stood out to me. So with that, Ellie, I guess I'm turning the question to you. Like, let's assume maybe there's people in this room who do not know Jesus, and so they've never felt that desire to, like, want to share their faith, but then may maybe there's also a good amount of people in the room where that desire has just become stale a little bit, but I think that's where we need to start because, like, before you want to share your faith and get into the tactics, like, we have to want to, right? So maybe talk about that, like, where does that desire come from? Yeah, I guess the beginning is so simple. It's Jesus. It's what he did for you. It's, a, it's, it's like, if you look at the gospel, I mean, God designed you to be with him. You were created to glorify him. That's your purpose, right? But something happened, and we were close with God, but we messed it up, and we sinned. And all of a sudden, we were doomed to die because he is a just God. He can't go back on his word. And when he says the punishment is sin is death, it has to be that way. Um, but he didn't want you to die. He wanted you to live. And so enter Jesus. Jesus said, I'll go. I don't want my kid to die. And because of that, we have the opportunity to now live forever with Jesus. And so where does it start? It's like, I think there's this misconception of Christianity, how like Jesus came and died for your sins. He didn't run down the mountain of sin and death and get there and say, okay, you're forgiven. Now climb. He came down and said, okay, you're forgiven. Now get on my back. Let's get out of here. You know, like he, he's the one who's going to lift you up. And so I guess if that's where you start, it's like, how do I experience that? I would say Psalms 40 is kind of my favorite picture of sharing the gospel of why you should even do it because it starts at a place you wouldn't expect like I might be talking and you're like well, what does that have to do with evangelism but bear with me and you think I would have had this opened before but just no I got it I think I put a sticky note no I didn't swag okay um Psalms 40 I'm just gonna read a couple verses Verse 1, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned to me, and he heard my cry for help. He brought me up from a desolate pit out of the muddy clay and set my feet on a rock. Pause there. Oh, wait, making my steps secure. Pause there. <laughs> um, notice the action there. Like, what am I doing? I am waiting patiently for the Lord, and I'm crying for help. That is two things I have done. And he has done the rest. He is the one who's picking me up. And he's the one who's redeeming all these horrible things that I've done. Whatever pit this is that I'm in, this desolate pit, he's the one who actually lifts me up. It's not my effort. And so that kind of hit me when I first started getting into evangelism. This verse, this chapter was like huge for me. So I was like, wait a second. It's actually not on me. I'm not the one having to do this. 
But the other thing I love is the Lord, the word the Lord. That word meant master, who's in control, who's driving the ship. And now we know it's synonymous with God, Lord, God. But back then, it, it had another t word. It was like, I'm in control. I'm the master of this land. And so I wonder, I wonder where I'm going when I need help. When I'm crying for help, am I going to feel better about myself by my job? When I'm in pain, am I going to people? Am I going to my spouse? Am I thinking about relationships, past, present, or future to give me purpose? Um, is my money more important to me? Is my... Is my oppression so intense that I can't notice he is Lord? Like, his status as Lord was never in question, but my awareness of his status as Lord is what changes. And so I think I love that first chunk of the verse. It's like, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry for help. It's all I've done is waiting patiently and crying for help because I know he's Lord. And then he fixes my life. And then look what happens. This is the part where evangelism comes in. Verse 3, he puts a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our, our God. So he actually, what you say changes, and what you're worshiping just starts to change. It's a result. And then many will see in fear, and they will trust in the Lord, and there's that evangelism. So it's like, if you look at where you start, it's, it's the gospel. Every morning you need it. Every day you need to remember why you exist, and he reminds us that we exist to rely on him, to glorify him, and laying down all these other lords of our life at his feet is where that begins, and then that desire will just start to happen. So. Nailed it. I love it. That was awesome. Um, I, I think, you know, I was sharing with the team actually before this when we were backstage, and this kind of builds off exactly what you were talking about in Psalm 40. I was thinking of Ephesians 2, I believe, and it says, um, for we were all once dead in our trespasses and sins, right? Like, just like you read in Psalm 40, it's like all we have was a cry for help. That's literally all we have. We didn't make any other effort besides that. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And it doesn't go on to say, but we worked harder, or we were, like, smarter than everyone else, and, and so we saved ourselves. It doesn't say any of that. It says, but God is in that transition. And, um... I think that's just exactly kind of what we're reading in Psalm 40. It's like God is the one intervening in, in us. And then you can't, that can't not put a new song in your heart. Like seeing that where we're so helpless and we're just crying out for him and him intervening for us, we don't have to, to work to gain God's praise. At that point, it's like, man, we're so like transformed by what he did for us. We're so on fire for what, like the fact that we were once dead in our trespasses and sins and now we're alive together in Christ. We can't help but share about it. It's what Garrett said. I, I think for me, like to answer this question of just um, what does it begin to look like to cultivate that desire? On a practical note, like Garrett said this as well. We all share about things. We're made to share about things. New Yorkers, we love our restaurants. Like, everyone's a foodie in New York. I've learned this over the past few years. That's right. Yep. Um, and when you, you can't, like, cut yourself off from the source. So if you're finding yourself, like, not wanting to share, I would first ask, like, well, what is just, what does your relationship with the Lord look like right now? Same with a restaurant, right? Like, if you're going every day, if you're seeing how good the food is, how great the ambiance is, how uh, personable the wait staff is, you're more inclined to share. If you stop going and you haven't been for three months, the chances of you sharing about that restaurant are just probably less likely, right? So I think my encouragement would be just to cultivate that desire. Just start with time with the Lord. Don't put a ton of pressure on uh, forcing something. We want to share with joy, not with guilt, right? And so I think it starts with just building that relationship with the Lord. Any other thoughts on, on this one? Okay. We'll keep rolling. We'll keep rolling. I love it. I did want to share just a few kind of experiences. Garrett shared a few experiences. That guy, <laughs> that guy who was so direct and was like, I'm coming. That's hilarious. That has not happened to me. Um, but I wanted just to share maybe some experiences, particularly maybe if there's an experience you think about, Ellie, that was one that uh, didn't feel forced for you. It just felt like, hey, this is coming out of an outflow of my desire. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, this is actually a couple weeks ago. It's, it's an awkward situation, so just, <laughs> but um, I was at work, and I had this coworker who I have just seen struggle in a lot of different ways, but, you know, you can't talk about God in the workplace. First of all, you absolutely can, and I'll show you how. This is like a really random experience, but um, I've been seeing him struggle, and obviously I know, okay, if I am struggling in this way, I know the solution, but you can't just go and say that, you know, to, like, you can't just throw that at people if they don't experience it for themselves. And so we were having this conversation at lunch, and he was talking about how his friend was just diagnosed with cancer. And I was just letting him talk. Like, I was letting him vent. It's really challenging. It's not looking good. Like, he was talking about the chances of him making it. So they're very low. And he was like, 
Um, but I don't get it. He's so hopeful. And I was like, boom, he's a Christian. I already knew. I was like, okay, this is an opportunity. And so I was like, oh, how? Like, tell me, what, what, are you, what is he doing that's so hopeful? I was like, I'm curious. Um, and I still didn't fully see the opportunity God was laying in front of me yet. Like, I was just kind of, it was natural. I was just like, oh, there's, this is a chance. But I wasn't sure. And he's like, yeah, he posted about praying the other day. And I didn't really get that. But he was talking about how he prayed to God. And that's where he's finding this confidence that it's all going to be okay, even though he might still have cancer and, and he might not make it. He was like, I ha- he has this, like, confidence from prayer. And I was like, interesting. And, I ha- and this is the part where as you cultivate with the, your relationship with the Holy Spirit, he gets a little louder. And I remember I was sitting there, and I had a choice. I could play it safe and just be like, wow, that's so cool. I love prayer. That's great. Or I could have just been something very vague. But I help, felt the Holy Spirit say, hey, tell him that story you've experienced with prayer. And so my family, my brother was really sick growing up. And there was a time when he had cancer. And it, it, they were going to this really big surgery. And I, what I told him was, I was saying, yeah, my brother had a tumor. And it was supposed to, like, be the end of it. Like, of his, like it was a really dark time for my family. Um, but my mom prayed. And she felt this peace. I, I didn't use the word peace. I tried to only use the words he used. So I said prayer and God. And that was basically it. But I said you know, she prayed to God, and she just kind of knew it was going to be okay, and they went in to the, do the surgery, and the tumor was gone, and my brother didn't have cancer. It was completely gone, and it, the, the doctors had no idea how it happened, and I was like, I just shared that story with him only using the words he used, so if I want to share about God in the workplace, there are ways to do it without getting fired, <laughs> but, um, this, you know, that's all I said, and, and this guy is Jewish, by the way, and so I never would have thought this would have worked, but he goes, wow, maybe there is a God, and I was like, oh. <laughs> What? I was, and then, like, I felt God be like, there it is, boom. Like, that's obedience in that moment where I'm listening to the Holy Spirit. Not for any reason. I'm not trying to, like, win a soul, really. I just saw him in need. And I was like, wait, I, I, prayer is great. It's awesome. And I just shared my experience with it. So that, I'm hoping one day I can get him here. This was literally last week. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's a random experience. It was very scary and awkward, but it ended up being so confirming. Like, it was cool. So, yeah. That's super cool. Um, I love that using the same words they used to. That's just like a really cool, like practical thing, especially in the work setting. Um, I had a good friend, like this experience just comes to mind and one out of desire. I think often there's real opportunity to share your faith with people in, um, in some of their like hard moments and some of their low moments, right? And, and I don't, my posture is that that's never like taking advantage of a low moment. I think in that moment they're looking for hope and we have, we believe we have the greatest hope. Right, like why, why would we not be sharing that? And I had a friend who was relatively young, relatively new in his marriage and was going through a divorce. And I just happened to be one of the kind of the first people that he had reached out to. And not an elaborate story, honestly, but I, I was on the phone with him and he was just talking about uh, how hard it was. And um, they were just trying to figure out how to like move out. And they had two dogs and like who takes a dog? They were just going through kind of all the stuff that happens when you're going through an, a divorce. And I just shared with him, I just said, hey, man, like, that's so hard. That's really, really tough. And um, I, I just know in, in hard times, like when I've been in tough times, like the hope that I can find, the only assurance I have is is in God. And I just kind of laid out the gospel for him. Pretty simple. Like it was nothing elaborate. It was not cool sounding. I promise if you were on the other line, I probably would have stumbled through it. And he honestly didn't like react in a significant way, but he was very thankful. And I just asked if I could pray for him. So we prayed on the phone. And... Um, that was it. Like, I haven't heard anything, like, from him since. He didn't follow up. And I think those moments have, have just taught me, and I, I think you could probably resonate with this, too. Like, the scoreboard, there's no scoreboard on getting a result. Like, there's no scoreboard on, like, the number of, of people you convert to Christianity, right? Like, God just wants you to be faithful in those moments. And I think that was a reminder for me of, like, there wasn't anything crazy that happened. But I took a step, and I was just faithful uh, in, in that moment. Um, and maybe God will. His timing is, is greater than ours, and, and so maybe he will. Um, where do we want to go next? Let's do, um, let's do this. Kind of as we wrap up here, and, and I, we're also wrapping up this series right now. So I want to think about, like, where do we go from here? And, and looking at us as a church. So obviously, I think when we think about sharing our faith, we apply that a lot individually. But I think there's certainly applications to us as a group. So Ellie, like, 
where would you, in speaking to the church here at Mission City, where do we go from here as we end this series? And, um, and band, you can go ahead, actually, and, and start to come on up. Where do we go from here as a series? And maybe just what would be, like, the final takeaway you would want to, to give everybody? You know, I think as we are praying about, you know, how, how are we going to mobilize, you know, what, what happens now, something that kept coming to mind was this pattern of, and I, again, I, read Psalms 40. It's really cool because it really goes through the rest of it, goes through the full scope of what it's like following Jesus, how we surrender, and then we fall in love with him because we spend time with him, um, and we just realize he's that great in other ways more than just his redeeming qualities, right? He's just majestic, and then things get hard, and um, but, but this, uh, there's consistently this flow of I get what I need from God, I'm encouraged either, you know, with people, but then I go out and I, and I share the gospel and then I come back to God and talk about how it went. So what I kind of see happening is like, if we as a church got what we need from God individually, if I'm going to him with what I need, and then I go out and I talk about Jesus and I come back and we talk about how it went and then we build each other up and we encourage and we share tools and tricks and oh, that conversation, that's kind of awkward. Maybe you could have said this or here's a tool I have about this and we just, we encourage each other and then we go back out and we come back and we talk about how it went and we get what we need from God and we encourage each other and we build each other up and then we go out again. And so that cycle of it's coming from God, my desire is growing, but I need help. Like we can't do it alone. It's, it is very scary. And it's like, People will say, oh, what if I say the wrong thing? You will. Like, let me just help you. You will say the wrong thing. But that's why we have a church. And so that's why we can encourage each other and remind us that it is the Holy Spirit, the one who's doing the work. Like, for me, something really comforting is understanding how I relate to each person of the Trinity. I know that sounds kind of weird, but I have the Holy Spirit in me driving the ship because I have Jesus that died for me, that allows me to commune with God, and I have a Father who's in control of everything going on around me. And so understanding how you are not, you're just um, accepting an invitation um, to share the gospel. You don't have to. It's like, it's an outflow, as we've been saying. So I think what I see happening would be that. That would be so cool if this summer, if we just like, and, and after the summer, we went out, we send each other out, and we come back, and we build each other up, encourage, get what we need from God, and then go back out again. I feel like that's kind of, I feel like it'd be fun. It's really fun. It's really fun, I promise. I love that. I, I, well, as you were doing that, I was pulling up Acts 2.42 because that's kind of the pinnacle verse of what the early church does, right? And we're seeing there, it's like you can't miss it. When you read it, it's describing the early church, and they're doing everything together. I think just in, today, and as New Yorkers, we do so many things individually but they're doing everything together, which was just kind of cool, stood out to me. I think just two, a uh, few things that popped into my head is, I, like, what do I want you guys to take away as we finish this series? Um, the first would just be, like, look for everyday opportunities. I think oftentimes we think, like, the clouds are parting, and God's going to give me this, like, mini sermon, and I'm just going to, like, nail it. And that's just not usually what happens. Here's the, the easiest layup that I know each of you guys experience, because I experience it all the time. Hey, Preston, what'd you do this weekend? Oh, yeah, man, I went to... Um, I went to church, uh, and I played, sometimes I'll drop that I played cajon. I dropped some really sick beats on cajon at church. Um, yeah, like, do, are you plugged into a church community at all? Or, like, are you, uh, like, do you have a faith? Like, easy transition into, uh, hey, I, I, yeah, I went to church. I spent my Sunday going to church. We got lunch after. Do you ever go to church? Plug the question, and then run and just see where it goes. That's it. So simple. Uh, so just look for, like, everyday type stuff. And then I think, like, another easy one is, like, Steph and I often just invite people into the things we're already doing, especially our community. And whether it was, like, bachelor party that I had or, like, weddings or lunches with people, I found that sometimes those, like, community moments are speak as much about uh, who God is uh, and what we are um, – just how we are stewards for him and stewards for the gospel by bringing people into the community. I think that can be uh, just like really impactful and kind of just an easy thing. So look for those every like day moments. How can you ingrain sharing your faith into what you're already doing? It's an outflow. And I think if we have that desire, those opportunities will just start to start to show up more and more. Um, thank you. This is great. Um, I'm going to have uh, Ellie pray. If you would just pray for us, um, Everything you discuss, just pray over that. And then just kind of as we're wrapping up this this series. Also, last thing I just want to plug, um, just be praying for Garrett and be praying for his dad. His dad's name's Dale. Um, uh, he had sent us a text this morning. So I know they're still just working through stuff. Just be praying for him uh, throughout the week. But if you, if you would pray for us. And then, Ben, you can, you can come on up. Yeah. All right. 
Oh, dear God, we, um, the only reason we have something to talk about is because of what you've done in our lives. Lord, there's absolutely no other reason to talk about you other than, you know, you. It's not for us. It's not an ego boost, Lord. It's just you break chains in our lives. And God, I think today, um, we want to lay down these other lords we have considered to be controlling us, God. These things that we are going to and we need help. You are the one who's going to give us everything we need. There's not one single thing, not one person, not one achievement that is going to give us satisfaction, that's going to heal us, that's going to redeem our life from the pit. And we're going to keep trying because we're human. We're going to keep running away. And you are so faithful to stick with us and to continuously, no matter how many times we ask you to lift us out of that pit, when we come to you and we lay down, our face hits the floor before you, and we have no other God but you, you are faithful to help us. You are faithful to redeem us, God. And that is that, that love we receive from you, that is what is going to go out and reach this city, Lord. What, the impact is, is fun to watch, Lord, but the result is not, it's not in our hands. It's such a, it's such a you thing. You know, success is taking initiative with the power of the Holy Spirit and then leaving the results to you, God. And so this week, or today, right now, would we just lay down whatever else we are allowing to be the center of our attention? And would we just go to you with what we need? Because you are the healer. We can't, we can't talk about you well. We won't be able to make you known if we don't know you first, Lord. It all starts there. So I pray um, as we let this be a more of a thing we want to do. If you want to cultivate that desire to talk about you and help others find you, would we start by just getting what we need from you, God? Because we know you are the only source. You are the only Lord, the only one in control. And so we just thank you that you've chosen us to be in this room today to hear your truth, to be reminded of your love. And I pray it something happens after this, God, that, that, that or the faith gets stirred up again, Lord, and we would just run fearlessly knowing you are going before us and you are with us. We thank you because we, we just love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us. If these messages are strengthening you in your faith, we want to hear from you. Find us online at missioncity.nyc or email us at info at missioncity.nyc so we can celebrate everything God's doing in your life. We'll see you next week.